Well, greetings and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to a new year of Building Power, Grassroots Education Advocacy with me, your host, Zakia Sankara Jabbar. And um, I'm really excited, right? I'm looking forward to this new year. I'm looking forward to more uh, great and impactful work on behalf of children, uh, especially marginalized children and African-American children in particular, right? Um, so I'm excited. Uh, my first guest um, is an amazing um, mom. She's a veteran homeschooler. And I want to read a little bit more uh, about what you're going to be in store for today and a little bit more about my guest, Ms. Kenna Clemens. So Ms. Kenna Clemens is a the creator of the Children of the Sun Classical African Center Homeschool Curriculum, and she's the co-founder of the Children of the Sun Classical Homeschool Intentional Community. She is also the owner and lead textile quilt artist at Jinam Quilt Studio, where she teaches the art of quilting and the rich history of African and African American quilting traditions, vibrant colors geometrical patterns and indigenous African fabrics set Miss Clemens teaching quilting brand apart. She and her husband, Baba G, have home educated their seven children in the Washington DMV area for 25 years. Education has always been a lifestyle for them with the principal goals of instilling in their children a lifelong love for nature, equipping them with the means to acquire knowledge rather than merely filling their heads with facts to pass standardized tests and teaching them how to live as opposed to simply teaching them how to make a living. Over the years, the Clemens implemented the FIRE approach and FIRE means freedom in real education where they allow their children ample time and space to explore their passions, their interests and hobbies during the school day, along with rigorous traditional academics. Currently, three of, three of the seven Clemens children are pursuing degrees in American universities. The eldest three are college graduates using their gifts and talents to effectuate change around the world and in black communities. Kiara Clemens, the youngest of the Clemens children, is the Children of the Sun Scholar, a Browder Scholar, Sankofa Scholar, and a Kobe Society Rites of Passage Initiate. I'm so excited to welcome you, Kenna. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I know we're going to have a great time talking about the Children of the Sun uh, homeschooling curriculum that you just dropped. I want to now allow you to share a little bit more about yourself um, with our audience. Anything that I may have missed in your bio that you'd like to share? Well, I think you covered it all. I had to ask myself, is she talking about me? <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you for having me on the show. I'm really excited to be here. And uh, I, uh, as you say, I am a mom and a wife. I'm a mom of seven children and I'm the wife of Baba G. And Baba G and I together have homeschooled our seven children for the last 25 years in uh, mm -hmm. Southern Maryland, Prince George's County, where we live. And our children range in ages from 15 to 26. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's been a real journey and I'm sort of winding down. So it's a wonderful thing. I almost feel like an empty nester. And I never thought that, uh, see the thing about it is when you have children, you know they're gonna grow up and leave you, but you really don't think about that. No one really told me that I was gonna work myself out of a job. And so sometimes that's very sad because I miss my children and I miss schooling them, but homeschooling never stops, never stops. That's right. And uh, I think you're the perfect expert because uh, that I want to talk to at the beginning of this year. Um, many parents and families are still, you know, uh, struggling uh, in this moment because, as you know, most of the public schools, especially here in Maryland, are still closed physically. Yes. And there's only so-called virtual or online learning, which has presented its own set of challenges. 
Um, I know for me personally, we have embarked on homeschooling our six-year-old daughter. And I have to admit to you, even though I knew you, I knew that you were a veteran. I know so many other homeschoolers, especially here in the D.C. area, the, you know, the St. Kofa Homeschooling Collective, which is very strong. But I still doubted myself. Right. I still felt this you know, ambivalence, if you will, and fear that mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to do this right because, you know, only the system can do it right. And I'm in Montgomery County and it's such a great school system. That's what everybody says. And it's like now, well, when I, the virtual learning didn't work for my daughter. I mean, when COVID started, she was in her second half of kindergarten year. And she's also a very active um, young lady. You, of course, you know my daughter personally, and she's also very intuitive and very smart. And so very this smart. has actually been the best thing for her and our family. We just submitted our portfolio um, to the school district, and I was impressed at what we've been able to do for her. Um, it has cost a little bit because we've had to buy materials or like, you know, we've been working with um, different coaches and tutors that, of course, we pay for their time and things like that. So um, there's certainly uh, some things that may be barriers for families. But I wanted to talk a little bit more about some of the tools and strategies and maybe some hope that you um, can give to parents like me who are nervous or feel that they're inadequate in homeschooling their own babies. Wow. I, you just warmed my heart because, you know, I was with you. I know when COVID hit and I know where you were professionally. And that's a lot. That has a lot to do with it for us as women, because for me, I had no desire to homeschool my children. I'm going to be very honest. I was a career woman. I had a very profitable uh, career that I loved working uh, for the government. Um, I was an intelligence operations specialist, an arms export control officer. I wore many hats in um, uh, government, you know. And so for me, homeschooling was not something that I, I wanted to do. Uh, my husband actually had the desire to homeschool, believe it or not, first. Uh, God put that, me? put that in his heart and uh, until I came around. And then when I finally did get the desire to homeschool, that's my daughter. Hi, Kamaria. She said, hi, mom. She's a guinea pig. When I did finally uh, get the desire in my heart to homeschool, there was nothing I could think about. I, it, it pained me to go to work. I, I, the desire was so great for me to be home with my children. And I say that because to address the fear. Fear is something that's natural. Um, but it's really something that we we need not experience as homeschoolers because we are the child's mother. God gave that child to us. We were the incubator for that child for nine months. We breathed for that child. So everything that we need, everything that we need for that child, God has given it to us. And if we don't have it, for example, I couldn't teach algebra because I'm political science, international relations. Algebra wasn't my thing. But God gives you the resources. And that's where community comes in. We had a beautiful community. What I couldn't teach, another mom teach. I couldn't teach past um, sixth grade math. You know, that wasn't my thing. But Same. oh my goodness. <laughs> There were some moms who could teach algebra, advanced algebra, calculus, and everything else. And so that's the freedom in real education. We talk about the fire. And you said that um, the virtual learning is something that is new and children are not designed to sit in front of a computer all day to learn. Not at all. And part of the fire approach that we used in our homeschool, which was very, very successful. And as a mom, they were, they represent the most beautiful memories and time of my life. And what we did was we have a large backyard. And so our backyard was our classroom um, during the winter. Uh, and I had seven. So it wasn't easy teaching seven at one time. You can't do round robin where you spend an hour with each child, you'd be exhausted. So you just throw everybody at the table and you do what's called a unit study and you're going to do it on your level. If you're kindergarten, you're going to draw a picture. If you're high school, you're going to write an essay. 
So that's the freedom in real education. And everybody's at the table at the same time, sort of like the Montessori approach. Um, and it was very effective for us, very effective. And for example, if you're studying Matthew Henson, Matthew Henson was um, an African-American explorer that went to the North Pole. And uh, unfortunately, our history is hidden from us. And so a lot of us don't, I didn't, why did I just learn that fact at 45 years old, who Matthew Henson was? So we were from the same area. Yeah, and you know, I, um, well, I'm from Des Moines, Iowa, actually, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And you said he was from the D.C. area? Oh, yeah. Matthew Henson. He's yeah. actually Taraji P. Henson, who was from D.C., as you know, oh, she's an actress. Right. She, that was her great, great uncle. I didn't make the connection. Yeah. So but why do we have to find out at 45 years old uh, his ac accomplishments as an African-American who contributed vastly to science and American society. And so we would go outside and um, we would uh, dress up in the winter and we would pretend like we were North Pole explorers. And I would have one baby on one hip, another baby on another hip, and the olders would have, older girls would have a baby on their hip, but we would be out in the snow playing and we would be um, learning at the same time. And I pray that those memories are what my children hold on to. Um, Absolutely. I, 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 you, you actually inspired me to share a little bit more. I, um, I, I'm so proud because I, I mean, my story is similar to yours and, you know, my, I, I obviously, you know, have a career, but my career is in activism and working yeah. in this area to improve um, education uh, outcomes specifically for our children and homeschooling my daughter, honestly, after this first um, semester has been the best decision I think my husband and I have made. And it was his decision as well. He's the one who forced me to get on board. You blessed my so, heart. Oh. Because I was just like, uh-uh, we, we can't do this. We got to work. Yes. Oh, what am I going to yes. do? I ain't got time for this. <laughs> you know? Yes, yes. Oh, and gosh. We're going to make it work. And and here it is. My children have actually been abused by the system. And here it is. I was still yeah. scared. I'm yeah. all African centered. I'm all of this and that. And here I am still scared, still wanting to put my children in the system and had. And so I felt a sense of conflict, um, you know, just all the contradictions. And now there's no way for a bunch of different reasons that we would allow her to go back to school. Never. We're done. We're Never. done. Um, Never. Now that we Never. know we can do it. And it's funny, Never. my CEO, uh, Chris Stewart, um, who's amazing here uh, at Brightbeam, he said that at the beginning of COVID, he said, what's going to happen is, is that families are going to realize they can yes. do it. Right? They can do it. You can do it. Homeschool all this time. Yes. Been, been abused in school. The kids are not yes. even getting educated that well anyway. Right. And so now I'm one of those parents. I'm living proof that even if it costs us a yeah. little bit, you know, on the side, yeah. because, you know, and, 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 and it's also been best for her. It, it really is. I see how mm. she doesn't feel bad about herself when she comes home. Yes. yes. You know, this yes. is psychological trauma that especially Ooh. black children, like my black babies, they're active kids. They're not the yes. kind that don't sit down in class. Uh, all 30, 45, 45 minutes and just get lectured to. They're up and around. You know what I'm saying? So, to, and my husband has the patience of Job. He's perfect yes, he does. At, he does. in homeschooling her. And he Mine literally too. allows her yes. to lead the education because I'm. Yes. Because yes. I didn't realize how socialized I was because I would get mad at first. I'm like, what are you doing mm -hmm. going outside? Mm -hmm. She's supposed to be learning. What are you yes. doing letting her do this? Yes. She's supposed to be learning. And he had to tell me she is learning. Absolutely. We don't to replicate what they do in the brick and mortar building at home. And I'm so glad that my husband checked me on that. And, and it's been great. And I literally see, you know, Kenna, she's reading now. And we did that. We wow. did that. Wow. Don't you feel proud? You feel, I proud. feel so proud. Yes. I feel so proud. You are blessing my heart because you have made a hundred and eighty degree I circle. Have. You know from, how scared I was. Yes. And that's that's the freedom in real education. That's the fire. You are on fire. You are excited about 
being with your child, spending time with your child. And and I know your husband very well. He yep. has a, a heart of gold like my husband. Yep. And he will take the time and, and be with her. And my husband did too. And yep. my husband, we did whatever it took. I worked uh, 12 hour shifts and I was home. I was actually one of the first persons to telecommute uh, for the federal government in the early 2000s. I was really blessed. And that's how I was able to homeschool. Um, so I, and still work because I, I needed to work. We needed the the money. That's another child, Kalila Clemens. That's another yeah. one of my children. <laughs> yeah. But um, so hi, Kalila. So we, um, she was my guinea pig. And so I, you know, I, we did whatever it took and financially it was difficult. Um, and it was very stressful, but for a while we both had to work. And so we did split shifts. So I was home two days a week and he was home two days a week. And I'll tell you a story. He would, he would get really involved and we were, I was schooling the children. Our classroom was our unfinished basement and we did whatever we had to do to make chalkboards and classrooms and find, we had a cherry wood conference table that we got secondhand. My kids were five years old sitting at a boardroom table that somebody yeah, donated yeah, yeah. and in swivel chairs, you know? And so dad would come out of the laundry room dressed up like Harriet Tubman one day, you know, and he had a straw <laughs> on and he had a cane and, you know, he was, and the children were embarrassed. You know, my oldest <laughs> child, because he had been in the school. You're telling all the secrets. <laughs> I'm telling all the secrets. He came around the laundry room looking like Harriet Tubman. And my oldest child, you talk about the psychology of it. No one was even there. We were in the privacy of our own home. But she was embarrassed. She was concerned of who was looking at her father. And so the first, and this is the nugget. Parents, you have to de-school. It's going yeah. to take some time. Like you said to your husband, why are you outside? You should be inside sitting at a desk. No, 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 no. That's how I learned. Everything is rigid. Sit down. Yes. This amount of time. You're supposed to be reading this, you know, <laughs> and it's not rigid at all. And I'm looking and I, you know, I'm trying not to tear up, but I'm looking at how she's blossoming. And yeah. I'm also at the same time trying to figure out something different for my son because Amir is doing the virtual learning. As you know, he'll be in high school next year. He's an eighth yeah. grader and he he really doesn't like the virtual learning. He actually hates it because he's a social he child. Does. Oh, oh yeah, well, then yeah. we have the answer. Oh, we have um, the answer. Yeah. Right. We have the answer. So it's called Sankofa Homeschool Community uh, Cultural Imperative Program. Um, a bin. We have programming, Children of the Sun. And um he Let's talk about that. Yeah. I think we want to hear more about the Children of the Sun curriculum. We want to okay. provide the website so people can and we have pictures here. Let's talk awesome. about it. Here we go. Oh, here we go. So yes, I am so excited. So this Children of the Sun is a product of uh, the Children of the Sun Homeschool Impotom, which is an intentional community. So uh, actually what happened was I was homeschooling my children, as I said, and I found that there was no culturally relevant curriculum available for us. This was in the early 2000s. Now there's a plethora of information. You guys are so blessed because in the 2000s, we didn't have any African-centered curriculum. And so, uh, what I decided, it, it was just something that was put in my heart. And so I started working on this curriculum and it was a community effort. Um, I'm so grateful for all of the people who were involved. I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, my co-director, Letitia Evans. Uh, she was right there in the beginning. Um, so many people, even from Sankofa, we have Maroon Life Learning. I hate calling names because you always forget someone, Dr. Chika Kua. I mean, we we really, it was a, it was a community effort uh, with myself and my husband at the helm. And so I began to write the curriculum so that we could have something to teach the children from a culturally relevant perspective. And basically, uh, that's how it, it started. And and once I started, I couldn't stop. It was just like, 
honestly, it was like the ancestors were speaking to me. Um, Dr. Jacob Carruthers' Intellectual Warfare was my inspiration. Um, um, uh, Sheikh Ante Diab, um, Asa Hilliard. I talk about this in, in the curriculum because not only is it a curriculum, but it's also, it includes 25 years of my experience and my nuggets and my research um, in African-centered education, classical African-centered education. The Children of the Sun curriculum is African-centered, but we're classical, which means that we we employ all of the basic tenets of African-centered education, but we draw our um, uh, resources from the now River Valley. And that's what makes it classical. We go back to Kemet in our pedagogy. Um, and that's where uh, Dr. Asa Hilliard, intellectual warfare, Jacob Carruthers, excuse me, in intellectual warfare laid out a complete, what you call Sebiad, African curriculum. And so that's what I did. I developed an African curriculum. So what is it? It is amazing. Yeah. You guys are going to love it. So it's actually three tiered. So okay. it's a compart, it's a it's a system. So we have the Culture Keepers Consciousness Work Curriculum Guide. Do you have the visual you can put? Is the visual up? I can't see the uh, screen. Yes, we can share that. It'll be pulled up in just a second. The visual guide. Yeah, we should be able to pull that up. Yes. Uh, so we um, so it's a three tiered system and it packs a powerful punch. It's very simple to use. That's what I love about it. And we're going to train people on how to use it. But once you get the idea of the pedagogy, you'll be able to implement it effortlessly and have fun doing it. So it's a this is our power pack. This is our gold collection. Um, but if you look in the center of this uh, uh, PowerPoint, you'll see the basic package, which is the Children of the Sun curriculum in guide in the center. And then we have an album. We actually, for our auditory learners, we actually recorded the Culture Keepers Consciousness work. I'm so grateful. Can I just say that I'm thankful that you yeah. kept in mind the different learning styles and how critically important that is that you have something for all of the learning styles. I remember when you first told me that I said that was ingenious. I, I usually the mainstream curriculums usually don't even have anything accompanying that that meets the needs no. of auditory or sometimes not even visual learners. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so the thing about our style of homeschooling is we use uh, textbooks as resources. We love library books. We use living books. And um, so the Children of the Sun curriculum is a framework. It lays out uh, all of the um, African history, culture, and heritage that is missing from the historical timeline. Yes. Um, because of the Ma'afa. See, our history did not start with the Middle Passage. So That's we don't right. even teach about slavery in the homeschool and until we teach about the great kingdoms of Africa from medieval Africa, like Mali and Songhai and all of in Zimbabwe, all of the great African kingdoms. We teach our children about those kingdoms first and who we were as African people, builders of world civilizations before we were enslaved in the brutal Holocaust Black Holocaust, because that doesn't define us. That's only half of the story. That's why it's the middle passage. And right. so that's a very empowering thing, uh, paradigm for Black children, because like you said, it's self-esteem. Like we don't, be, the American school system destroys us as Black children Woo. because of the European supremacy and I'm gonna tell tell it like it is, and I'm gonna tell if we have time my story growing up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and joining Iowa, where I was traumatized. Let's tell um, that story because it's about integration. Yes, and that and that comes out in my book. I talk a lot about integration because I was a social science experiment. I just discovered from my research that during the 70s, me and Andre Davis, who is a phenomenal educator doing some things in Wisconsin. We were social experiments of the 70s in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And what they did was they bust us to the suburbs. And it was the most, uh, there was some good things from it, but all in all, I would have to say it was a very 
um, bad experience for us because we were, as Dr. Chika Majegna says, we were, and Malifa Asante, we were decentered. We were taken off of our cultural from our from our cultural grounding because we lived in predominantly black communities and we went to predominantly black schools where our teachers were black. They looked like us. They affirmed us. They understood us. And then one day we woke up and they said, you're going to go to school and you're going to get on a bus. It's going to take you an hour. You're going to be packed in this bus like sardines and you're going to go to this white school and integrate this school. Oh, it was so traumatic. Um, you know, we were, like I said, we were just taken off of our cultural, um, our cultural base. And it wasn't, it took me years to actually did find you, did myself. Did you heard of all your black teachers and you ended up with all white ones? We did. Oh, we did. Wow. We had all white teachers. We had some good teachers who really cared about us. And I want to, I want to give um, the teachers, uh, who really care, I want to give them a shout out because I'm not brutalizing because they're in a system that doesn't even serve them, let alone its constituents. It's not their fault. They are teachers who really care about our children. And I was at a, a beautiful conference last February in Wisconsin, right before COVID hit. And it was, um, uh, as I said, uh, Andrea Davis, she's uh, the director for culturally responsive practices in the state of uh, Wisconsin, Madison University of Wisconsin, connected with Dr. Gloria Lassen Billings. They're doing some phenomenal things. And she has an annual Black History Conference. And it was amazing because the educators there were European. And I'm used to, you know, I'm in Chocolate City. When we travel, we, we used to being with African-American educators. And so that was a new paradigm for me, but I could really feel their hearts. They, they bought our, our, our African centered, used their own money to purchase their, our curriculum. And they really, really care about our children. And so those are the people we have to support. We have to give them the resources um, because they're on the front lines. Um, and so it, it's just amazing, I think, um, the time that we're in now and the choices that we educate. The last thing I want to say for on with regard to the public school system, I'm beginning to feel like we need to pressure them because there are our tax dollars. I have been paying taxes to the American public school system for over 20 years now, and I have not reaped not one benefit from it. Yep, talk about it. So where is my money going? I need some, I need some return on my tax dollars because I'm supporting the school system that my children aren't even aren't even using. That's the question. And I'm so glad you are centering that because I get tons of pushback, as you probably can imagine, especially in this COVID environment. They're forcing online learning, which in some cases, I mean, I don't want to like totally just, you know, this bash on online learning. It just doesn't work for me and my family. And I know several plenty of other families. And even from the data, it's not working for a whole lot of kids. Um, right. And I'm not saying that the education in person was all that great. I am saying what you are saying at this point, and that is we need to uh, have education back in the hands of the people, particularly black yes. folks. And, and yes. you just said it, a social science experiment. You yes. know, education hasn't worked out that well since uh, so-called integration, which they were never really integrated, if we're honest about that. What it did was got rid of our brilliant Black teachers who actually loved yes. us and talk. Yes. Um, and, and, and we do need to have a conversation about the per-pupil uh, expenditure because we should, there's, no, there's no need for 12th in Maryland for almost $13,000 a head and all you providing is online education and oh, don't get me started. Exactly. But we do need to have a conversation about since parents are literally, especially if they are you know, providing all the scaffolding support in the home now, where is our support? I mentioned at the outset, you know, my husband and I are not doing what we're having to do, but we're still paying taxes to the system and being Absolutely. double taxed because we still have to educate both of our children. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and we need it. to have a conversation about that. We need to have sure. a conversation. And um, I'm, I'm thinking that uh, 
uh, President-elect Biden has appointed Dr. Miguel Cardona um, as the, he's his pick for education secretary. And apparently uh, Dr. Cardona, I don't know anything about him. I actually learned this on your uh, grass, your website. Thank you, uh, Citizen Ed, for sharing this information. But listen to what he recently tweeted about his department. He said that his department will be a student, educator, and family first education department. You have my word. We're going to hold him to that. Have to. We're going to hold him to that because we need to have a greater voice in the education because the fact remains that the American education system has failed our children, not only our children, but pretty much all American children since, Amen <laughs> since its inception and yeah. especially black children. Because if you look at the prison industrial pipeline, That's three right. out of five children do not graduate. I have statistics. They do not graduate. They get caught up in the prison pipeline. The prison pipeline, right? The prison pipeline, and and this has got to stop because I my family has been personally affected by it, and it's something that I don't talk about. But I'm going to start coming out of the closet, and I am going to be on the battlefield for our youth who are caught up in the industrial prison complex. And Michelle um, um, Alexander, um, is right. that, she She hits it, the book. I mean, this she really brings it on. And, yeah, and I met so, her when the book first came out. She was at Ohio State University at the time at the law school. She is, She's amazing, isn't she? And that yeah. book is amazing. And we have to dust that off because it's really getting worse for our young Black people girls and well, boys. See, that's why we're here. And, and that's why I wanted to start this year off with you because you are a resource. You developed a resource that parents, uh, you know, can have access to. There's no excuses. We've done it before. We can do it again. Yeah, Listen, absolutely. I have said publicly now, I've come, I have come out the closet that I am done with this charade of um, talking at nauseam about what the problem is, but we're never getting to solutions. I'm done with it. And I right. think that it's time uh, in this 21st century, in this 2021, um, that we develop uh, mutual aid, benevolent societies again. And I, and I have to say, I came to that conclusion probably a couple of years ago, but I kept it to myself. But most recently with this pandemic and saying as how pandemics um, and this COVID has exasperated the things that were already going horribly for people, the families who are already on the margin. And then we have a, a government that could only muster up $600 one time. For wow. people. I don't know what else uh, we, what else evidence do we need that we are on our own? You know right. what I'm saying? Exactly. We're on yes. our own. And so we, we, and we have been, and thankfully I have seen mutual aid pop up in response to COVID and people are providing, you know, food for people and clothes. And I've been giving away clothes because my kids yes. are, are blessed and I give away things all the time. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> we have to do this in the education realm. And the reason why I say that is because I also see education going down the road of um, being uh, mostly digital and, and AI uh, by 2010, uh, meaning that the teachers uh, will, will largely be uh, laid off and, and we'll have uh, fewer teachers mm -hmm. and most yeah. of the education will be online for uh, providing particularly for the, the kids who are already on the margins. Now, people with uh, means and rich families will still have micro schools. We saw them pop up immediately. Mm -hmm. yes. Those white people who have resources, I'm sure some yes. blacks who have resources, they started micro schools. I live in Montgomery right. County, Maryland, as you know, and there are pods all over this county. Um, but the, the working class families are, don't have access to that. So that's where I think the benevolent society and mutual aid yes. where we come together and expand upon what you have already been doing in the Sankofa Homeschooling Collective have already been doing. And I think the charge um, is for us to do it now and use Absolutely. you as a resource. Absolutely. And that is the model. The pods and the micro schools, we've been doing that for 25 years. That's yeah. nothing new. The pod is just a co-op. It's just a homeschool co-op. Or yeah. say, for example, uh, five families 
who have tested negative for pot for COVID decide we're going to meet for chemistry at um, Mama Laster's house because Mama Laster teaches she's good with chemistry. And so that's a pod. So every Wednesday and Monday, we come to your house and and she teaches the children. And you know what? It's the most, of course, that's for moms who are able to be home. And, and there are solutions for those who can't be home. But we that was the best thing because us moms would sit around, man. We would talk. We would, that's how we would grow. We would be, our marriages would be improved. Our cooking would be improved because we would share recipes. And the kids were learning. It was a holistic approach. And then when that class was over, if I taught history, then I would teach history. So the pods, the micro schools, you don't have to have money to do it. That's what I mean. Yeah, that's what I mean. When you come together like mutual aid, like what you're describing, where yeah. you don't have to have a whole lot of money, you know, as long as you got gas to go over somebody's house. Like it, it don't have to Absolutely. cost a lot. It yeah. doesn't have to cost a lot. And when and those families that didn't have the money, because we had seven kids and I didn't finish telling my story. So I worked <laughs> for a while, but when that when that desire to be home with my babies became so great that I could not stand to be at work and it started affecting my work performance, I knew that I had to make a command decision. And I went before the creator and I said, I said, if I choose Is that me? You know, I, I'm just asking that you will you will bless me for this. And so, um, you know what the spirit said to me? Your faith is greater than riches. And that's a long story I'll tell on another uh, segment. But I walk by faith. And it was not an easy walk. For five years, we lived off of about $50,000 a year with seven kids. And it was very, very difficult. And my children came up on the rough side of the mountain. They will tell you that. Um, but but the sacrifice is worth it. It's worth it. Because when I look at my children now and I look at what we've poured into them and how the divine spirit has given all of that back that I've sacrificed. So moms, don't worry. If you give up your job, you're going to get it back. I'm a living witness. Yes. You're going to get it back. Because if you if you obey spirit, if spirit is telling you to do this for your children, then everything is going to be provided for you. And it may not even be in this. It may be 10 years from now, maybe 15 years from now, mm -hmm. but it will be provided. Trust me. And you will see the fruits of your labor. Yeah, the universe will provide. Certainly it will conspire. Um, to, to make it happen. You know, when I advertise this, I have to share that people were excited because people were asking me, oh my goodness, is she a quilter? I said, yes, <laughs> she is. She's one of the best. So we have to talk about that. Let's, yes. talk, yeah. Let's talk about right. it. Right. Let's talk about it. So that's my passion. Can yeah. you put up the Black Panther slide? So yeah. um, I am... Um, I am also a textile quilt artist, as everyone knows, and um, I actually use my quilting brand in the classroom to teach both educators and yeah, students. Yeah. And um, I have a quilting brand, um, and um, I, I, it's it's my passion. It's something I love. If I could, I would quilt all day long, and um, it's just been wonderful. My Black Panther quilt has taken um, the uh, nation by storm. I'm so happy and proud to say. Um, and especially uh, after the passing of uh, Brother Chadwick Boseman, it, it was very sad. And um, I was happy that I had invested in this project because now I have probably the only remaining um, Black Panther quilts left. Uh, the moment news hit, it was really bizarre because at I had it was funny because I had just made a purchase of some more fabric, some more Black Panther fabric. Uh, something said, "Go order some fabric," and it was about two days, sadly, before um, Brother uh, Chadwick Boseman passed. And mm -hmm. uh, so I placed the order, and honest to God, two days later I got the news, 
And I was so sad. And when I went back online yeah. to purchase the rest of the fabric, it was, it was gone. gone. It was gone. gone. Yeah. And then here's the mystical thing about it. The fabric that I had ordered, it was held up at midnight on the day he passed. I did not see that fabric for two weeks. Mm. It, I had no idea where it was for two weeks. I didn't know if it was ever going to get to me. Remember when Trump took the mailboxes away? It was held up in Trump territory. So <laughs> ironic. Lord have mercy. I only came. And so, yeah. look, hi, Angie. She loves her quilt. Yes. Thank you, sister. I hope you, uh, everybody who has one of Mama Kenneth's quilts, give me a shout out. If you have a Black Panther quilt, it's a limited edition. So, you're very blessed because, as I said, the fabric is not available. So, right, Black Panther quilt. Now, the Black Panther quilt. Why is it important? It's important because it builds self-esteem in Black children. When Black children see the images of themselves in the quilt, and their they their self-esteem and their self-confidence is is enhanced, and they they are excited to learn. And so, I, like I said, thanks to a bin, I want to give uh, Shelly and Mama Deborah a shout out. We took it to uh, the West Coast. Yes. And, uh, the Black um, Students of California United, they love the Black Panther. And uh, and we also took it to the educators at the Stanford Institute because uh, right. you were there. Yeah, yes, that was there. Yeah, a couple years ago. And, uh, and we took it, we took it there and it, it's just Black Panther has just been doing what it's supposed to do. And that is revolutionizing education for our children. Hey, right. This is right. <laughs> so, so one of the things that I wanted to ask too, is like, you know, I know that's your passion, but can you give us some of a little bit of the historical significance of quilting for Africans and, and African-Americans and why it's important? Oh, see now, don't get me started now. You know, I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher at heart. So uh, briefly, that's actually my passion. I actually love researching and I'm actually writing a book called The Stories That Quilts Tell. And so I'm going to, I've been doing research on that for about two years, three years, actually. I've been traveling all over the United States, uh, interviewing people about their ancestral heritage and the quilts that are in their family. And and you, the stories that the quilts tell are really important because you can find out how many generations you can trace your family ancestral heritage back through the quilts. Um, so, um, and look, I don't, what's the question? I forgot the question. I went off yeah, on no, I, no, you, you were talking about it, the historical significance of, right. of the quilts for Africans right. um, starting on the continent. And then, of course, we brought the traditions, the cultural traditions here. Yes, as well. yes, that's it. So actually, the uh, historical tradition for not quilting, but for weaving goes back to Africa. In Africa, the men were the weavers. The women did not handle the fabric. Um, it wasn't until, from what I understand in my research, it wasn't until the Ma'afa, the Black Holocaust, when uh, uh, African women were on the plantation because European women were already quilting and they were doing a, a, a applique, is a French word that's a, a technique in quilting where you sew on images and you apply, it comes from the word apply. So on the plantations, it became uh, something that was transmitted and shared between uh, the our, our ancestors and the women, the European women on the plantation. And so our uh, ancestors had to quilt for necessity uh, because they needed bed coverings and they needed clothing to stay warm. So that's where you get what you call the scrap quilts. A scrap quilt is where you just take, I'm, I'm, my brand is called Scraps of Africa because I work with scraps, little tiny pieces of fabric, two inches, and I make creations from them. And so our ancestors would tear the fabric. They would take those corduroy britches and they would take the pancake sacks and the flower sacks and they would make clothing, quilts out of them to stay warm. And so uh, there's an African-American woman, woman called Harriet Powers, who was an enslaved woman who actually was just anointed and gifted. And she, uh, we have some of her quilts today and she
astrology incorporated into her quilts. And uh, she had to sell her quilts because she fell on hard times. And the story goes that she called each one her baby. And I, I know how she felt because um, there are many times I've had to sell my babies in order to put food on the table. And so Harriet Powers had to sell her quilt. And because she did, we now have them because she sold them to a European woman and the woman preserved them. And they're now preserved in the uh, Metropolitan uh, Museum or a couple of museums around the United States. And so if she hadn't fallen on hard times and she hadn't sold her quilts, we would not have them. And so that's a little bit of the history. Now, um, in Africa, as I say, the men are the weavers, uh, but you have a very, very rich history of African textiles and fabrics. And that's what I love working with. I'm an mm -hmm. importer and I started a, a woman's, a black woman's economic empowerment cooperative. And oh, nice. so we um, come together and share our resources. And by doing so, we're able to um, buy and trade on the continent of Africa and support our African brothers and sisters who are there um, by with our purchases of our fabric and our, our textiles. And then we market those goods here in the United States. So I can say I have an import export business and I'm proud to say that. Um, because as I said, my career with the government, I was an arms export control officer. I was responsible for um, regulating the uh, sale of weapons. Um, and so I would much rather be regulating the sale of my own goods instead Amen. of for the American government. Wow, that's, that's um, an important history. And I know that our audience certainly uh, appreciated it. I'm sure we um, have a couple of questions um, from the audience. One of them came up and I thought this was a really good one. This was back when we were talking about sort of some of the costs and how the per pupil per capita is right now, parents don't have access to that. And uh, one of the questions is, are, you know, people were wondering, are homeschooling costs tax deductible? If not, it should be since homeschoolers do not benefit from the public education financed by tax dollars. Is that something that you've talked about in terms of looking at a strategy um, and since we're here in the state of Maryland, which we will trust me, we'll face an uphill battle because it's a deep yes. union state that has very deep ties to the unions and unions usually yes. don't support homeschooling efforts. Um, is that something, do you think um, there could be some organizing around? Um, I think there could be, definitely. Uh, this is a grassroots education advocacy, building power citizens uh, group. So I don't see why not. And particularly because of the time that we're in now with the focus um, being on um, virtual learning. Um, Which is not working and parents need other options. They need other options. And I think, and I want to, if we have time, because um, I, I want to talk about the mental health of our children real quick, because Please, if you're saying important. that the homeschooling is not working. And so we have to the, the silver lining in COVID now is that people are starting to focus on mental health mm -hmm. and mental health, because I'm a holistic healer body, mind, spirit, soul. We don't just and that and the children of the sun curriculum is holistic in that respect. It doesn't just teach facts. It deals with the whole child. Yes. Because our children are unique learners. Our children do not learn in a traditional way. And so you have to minister to the spirit of an African child. That's, That's right. why drums are so important in our homeschool and in our culture. When our African children, if that child is acting up in the classroom, I challenge the teacher, just go get some drums and start playing the drums and beating on the drums and see if you don't get some kind of order in the classroom. Wow. So our, I want to give a shout out to um, these queens, uh, Dr. Afia Mbili Shaka, and I'm not going to try to say the names of the others, her colleagues, uh, Danielle Apogo, Lynette Mawahini, um, they um, have just come out with this phenomenal book called Strong Black Girls. And I, this book- I that for my daughter. Where oh, did you get it? Ooh, you have to order it online. I recommend that you order this book. It will minister not only to you, 
it will minister to your very soul because our we are in this book. Our experience. What's the, what's the first author's name? Afia and Billy Shaka. That's uh, brother. Uh, what's his name? Wife. Uh -huh. He's wife. Uh huh. Dr. Afia. She's the chairman of the uh, psychology department at the University of the District of Columbia. She's a phenomenal educator, a phenomenal healer in our community. Um, she's um, a part of the Children of the Sun um, affiliation and. Um, so I just strongly recommend that everybody purchase this book, Strong Black Girls, because it deals with bullying. It deals with what our girls are going through. And I saw myself on the pages of this book and I cried in the middle of the night as I was reading it, as the words just ministered to the very soul. Because I'll tell you real quick why it's important for us to grab yeah. hold of this. Our children are being traumatized and, and, and we have to just, we have to address the elephant in the room. So, and it's subtle and, and, it, and it comes out in ways that, you're, that you really don't see until later. You think they're okay, but they're mm -hmm. not okay. Right. So for, I'm going to share any, this doesn't happen now. I, I know this doesn't happen because it, it would be an outcry. But when I was a young girl in Des Moines, Iowa, of course, I was the only African-American in the entire school, my brother and I. But I can remember being at a daycare and my mom's on. She probably remembers, too. I probably was only five years old. And it was a daycare and there was a European woman who um it was lunchtime and I have an, an epiphany. I hate peas. And she literally me. It was a, it was like, you are going to eat microaggression. You are going to eat these peas. And do you know, she literally stuffed them down my throat. Wow. <laughs> literally stuffed them. It was like, she was saying, you know, this little what you know i i don't in her mind who knows what she was saying but she was just yeah, like this yeah. little girl is going to obey me she's going to eat these peas and needless to say i never went back my mm -hmm. mom i don't know what my mom said but i never went back but i'm using that as an example to share the trauma and 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 not only that but strong black girls addresses the bullying that is occurring mm -hmm. in exponential degrees in our communities. And I was bullied as I was severely bullied in Milwaukee, Wisconsin by black people. Mm. And so that's that plant plantation mentality. Sadly. And so, you know, that's the sad thing. And um, to the point where I was physically, physically abused in fourth, fifth grade, all through uh, junior, um, all through elementary school. And so you ha we have to recognize that that's happening now, even today. And oh, so strong it's, black probably girls, worse. Yeah. it's worse and strong black girls addresses that. And what I like about strong black girls is that it offers solutions. I Not love. only does it address the problem. I'm getting it for my daughter. It offers solutions. And, and another thing, and it's and you're going to get it for yourself as well. I'm warning the moms who are deciding to homeschool. You think you're homeschooling for your children, but you're homeschooling for yourself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you're homeschooling for yourself. I want to give a shout out for a couple other books, if I can, real quick. Uh, sure. Mike Degna. Dr. Chika uh, Kua. He's been on the show. Yes, absolutely. Yes. He's been Reading on this program. Revolution. Yes. Powerful, powerful. The Children of the Sun curriculum dovetails with Dr. Chika Kua's book. So if you get the Children of the Sun curriculum, it's worth the investment. I strongly, because it it, it, it seems like you talked about the, the resources and the money. You have to spend a little bit of money you to get your resources. Down. Little bit. But once you make that investment, and some of those are tax deductible, but once you make the investment, you'll always have it. Um, and so this is another resource I highly recommend. It's called Let's Grow by my brother, uh, doc, uh, brother Uriah Yisrael out of Atlanta. And right now there's a Baba Wakesa and Mama Fia, uh, the Inglow Garden. There's a lot of focus within our communities. Our about, communities. Um, 
horticulture and, and um, yes. gardening. Yes, sustainable. You have to get a wealth of information. I need that book too. Yes, and see, this it comes in our power pack. So if you buy our curriculum, oh, we that's get all of these. Okay, we'll buy them. You don't have pack. to. You can buy them separately from their website. But why you might as well? I'm making them available. That's the thing. I'm making them available we have for you. Book, but we can get another one. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't have to go. I've done the work for you, so that you don't have to go. Uh, shopping. We have a power pack. We have our power pack that you're able to uh, purchase and everything is at a discount. We have Kamala now, Academy too. I got to get him on the program. In fact, I might have him in tomorrow. Yes, yeah. That's yeah. my brother. That's my brother. When I first decided to, to do an African-centered homeschool curriculum, I consulted Dr. Uh, Samari. And so he has been in my corner every step of the way. And the last thing I want to share now, this, I'm going to drop some nuggets on y'all right now. Okay, y'all ready? You got to tell us the surprise before we get off. Right. We got five more yes. minutes. I, okay. So this, you see this? Yes. You can get your hands on this. This is by Dr. Malifa Asante. Our books, we had to do another show, sister, because our books are where they're outpricing us. You can't find this book anywhere. You can't find you have it yet. in the power pack. That's why you want to get Mama Kenneth's children on some power pack because we got it for you. Okay, we got it in the power pack. Now, I want to share. Now, you know, I'm an educator at heart. So now we're going to have a test. Everybody get out your paper and pencil. We're going to have a test. <laughs> A one last shout out. This is my sister's book for your to minister to you. So unveil the gift. Okay, I got to give her a shout out, <laughs> Suzanne Williams. Suzanne Williams, because you got a mama's soul got to be ministered to too, because you got to be fortified to teach these kids. All right, so we're gonna do some. And my daughter's trying to get on camera with me. Okay, so that the homeschoolers want to take over. You get on the chat. Get on the chat. Okay, here's the nugget. Okay, here's the nugget. So. How many of you know, can we pull up the third eye revelation real quick? How many of you know that our ancestors are on silver dollars? I, I, in the chat, just start, just start sitting in the chat. How many of you know that Booker T. Washington and George Washington Carver are on U.S. silver dollars? I did not know that. Wow. Okay. So you know what they say, if you want to hide something from a black man, where are you going to put it? Oh. In a book? No, that's not true. That's We changing that. We changing that paradigm. Because that's when they couldn't, we couldn't read. Because you know it was illegal for us to read. We can read now. And everybody's reading. So that's paradigm has changed. So now we know. You heard it from Mama Kenna. So I'm going to tell y'all real quick the story. So. And had this wonderful idea Washington on this silver dollar. You break it up a little bit. They missed all of these silver dollars that are actually beautiful with um with Booker T on them. And so I don't know what happened. I guess they were in circulation, they didn't sell or something. So they decided in 1952, they said we're gonna melt down Booker. And we're going to put Booker T and George Washington together on one coin. Wow. And so that's what they did. Now, look at how much. $2,500 on eBay. I looked at it. Hey, I don't know if I have a 1947D, but look, it's $2,250. Somebody knows something about you. They don't want you to know. That's what I right. crazy say, right? Somebody knows something about you they don't want you to know. So now you heard it from Mama McKenna. That's right. And the <laughs> lot of people in the chat did not know that. Like you said, that's I, I love bringing um, folks on that's providing this kind of information, things that we don't know about in our community. And I want to encourage everyone yes. to check out the resources. We told you we was coming with resources yes. on the show. That's what Building yes. Power is about, you all. Um, my goal is to always bring some solutions to the table. We talk so yes. much about the problems and the yes. goal is to bring solutions. And I always yes. tap my deep network because I know so many wonderful people like Mama Kenna and others 
who have a deep amount of knowledge, who can connect us to other people who have the knowledge, as you see here with all of the books and resources um, that she provided. The other thing um, that people can do is to make sure that you get the curriculum, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Look at it, don't look at it as a whoo, you know, I might, it's fine if you don't have it right now, but when you do yeah. have it, Save up for it because your children are an investment and our ancestors have the answers. We should be trusting uh, African epistemology, African Centered Scholarship. Mama yes. Kenneth is our time today. I um, definitely want to have you back. Um, I'm going to be placing my order um, and I'm saying this on live uh, TV so yes. people can accountable. Thank I you. have um, the order screen pulled up. I just, when we hang up, I got to grab my credit yeah. card. And we will be <laughs> This, Thank you. Uh, this Thank you. Uh, uh, curriculum for my two children um, because we also have to put our money where our mouth is, you yes. know, when it comes yes. to these kind of things. But this has been um, phenomenal. This has been Thank amazing. You. Start off this year, my very first broadcast with you providing these um, tools for our community. And we will send you the link to this. Thank you so much. And next week, we're here, same place, same time, Wednesday, building power, grassroots education advocacy with.